there, you're very welcome to this episode of Dark Vanishings. I hope you're keeping well wherever you are in the world. Today's episode is about the mysterious disappearance of Maura Murray. Maura disappeared on a snowy evening on the 9th of February 2004 in New Hampshire. She crashed her car and she has never been seen since. Maura was aged just 21. Her disappearance coincided with the creation of Facebook. So as you can imagine, the case has garnered a huge amount of interest on Facebook and across other social media channels. Maura was born on the 4th of May in 1982. She grew up in an Irish Catholic household. I'm an Irish lady myself. And uh, you can see her here all smiles with her sisters and brothers and her mother. Uh, she had two older sisters, Julie and Kathleen, an older brother, Fred, and a half brother, Kurt, pictured there on the left. And that's her mother uh, in the blue in the photograph. Julie has been, as have all uh, Maura's family, incredible advocates for Maura. Uh, Maura's father as well has worked tirelessly to, uh, you know, try and find his daughter. Julie, in a number of interviews, describes the fun that she had with Moore growing up. So there was lots of fun, lots of banter in this uh, household. It seems to have been a, a happy childhood. It wasn't without its challenges. Moore's parents divorced when she was just six years old, but she remained close to her father, even though she lived with her mother. And he was a steady, strong presence in her life, along with her mother and family, uh, which was wonderful. Maura was born in Hanson in Massachusetts, where she grew up and she went to school. Here we see her pictured with her father, a medical technologist, in happier times. They like to do lots of activities together, for example, hiking, etc. Um, and it's clear that Maura's uh, family, her siblings, her parents, you know, they all looked out for each other, which was wonderful. And we can see uh, that Maura's family continue to look out for her, even though she's been missing all these years. The search for Maura uh, has never stopped. Maura was incredibly athletic. Here we see her running in a competition. She was a star athlete at school. She was also incredibly academic, so she was a high achiever. Julie also loved sports. Um, you know, they seemed to like outdoor activities, as did their father, Fred. The three of them would often go hiking, etc. So they were very outdoorsy and they got to spend a lot of quality time together through these activities. So after Maura finished school, she went to West Point Academy where her sister Julie was already studying. And I'm sure that was an added draw. Both girls were very close with a lot of common interests. Maura would study chemical engineering, but it would soon transpire that West Point wasn't for her. Uh, she enjoyed the academic side of life, you know, the sporting activities, but she didn't like the military end of things so much, the regimented nature of all of that. And uh, she also had a misfortune while she was in West Point. Now, some people would say that Maura was the author of this misfortune herself. She was found with a lip gloss in her pocket from the commissary shop that hadn't been paid for. And this was viewed very seriously by West Point because obviously in the military, there is a code of conduct around honesty, etc. So an investigation commenced and it was quite serious to such an extent that Maura felt she was falling behind in her studies, uh, her sporting activities, etc. So Maura decided to drop out. She wasn't really enjoying the programme anyway. And I'm sure, you know, the investigation was probably an added motivation. So she uh, decided to transfer to UMass Amherst, where she would be studying nursing. There was a nursing programme there. And um, thankfully, she had no permanent record, uh, you know, permanent black mark on her student record at West Point. Uh, once she left, the investigation also uh, ceased. So she had survived this uh, ordeal in, intact, if you like. Now, some people have said that this incident perhaps portrays, you know, Maura in a bad light, that she had a bad character. And some other things happened to Maura that other people have said, you know, this indicates that Maura did not have a good character. During this video, I will be looking at this and some other incidences that happened to Maura that were, you know, of a similar nature through a more sympathetic lens. I do think that there is an explanation for this behaviour and that it doesn't imply that Maura had a bad character. 
Whilst at West Point, Moore would meet a man called Bill Rausch and they would begin dating. Now, Bill was two years older than Moore. After she transferred, their relationship continued. Now, it would emerge after Moore disappeared that the relationship maybe, you know, wasn't quite as harmonious at all times as, you know, might have appeared. Now, that's the case for a lot of relationships. And we do have to remember that their relationship started on a face to face basis. Uh, you know, they were in the same college and then eventually Moore would move to another college. So that could have been an added pressure for them. But it would seem that on the whole, they were a very happy couple. We see them here all smiles. Fred said, Moore's father, that they were planning to get engaged when Moore would finish her studies. So it was a serious relationship and all relationships, particularly, you know, relationships that are forged at college, you know, they have their ups and downs. So now I'd like to look at the days leading up to Moore's disappearance. So before we get into the immediate few days before Moore's disappearance, I'd just like to mention an incident that happened in November 2003. Moore was found to have committed credit card fraud. Uh, she had found credit card details somewhere. Um, she was using these to order pizzas and subs in large quantities from Domino's. The police were actually in Domino's investigating um, this expenditure on somebody's credit card. Uh, when Moore rang through her order. They then followed the driver back to the dorm and discovered that it was actually Moore who was um, making these orders. Now, there was an investigation, um, you know, by the police, the college, obviously also the university, should I say, had to look at this as well. Um, and eventually it was decided that Moore would have to keep a clean record for three months, you know, to avoid any kind of black mark on her, you know, student record. So when we hear of this incident, it would make you think that potentially Moore did steal the lip gloss. But I would like to look at these um, incidences through a more sympathetic light. Um, you know, when I get to discussing what I feel is key uh, theory in relation to the case. So I will be revisiting uh, these incidences shortly. On the 5th of February 2004, Maury was doing one of her part-time jobs. She was on the security desk checking the cards of people coming in and out of the dorm. Around 10, 10.30 p.m., she would receive a call from her older sister, Kathleen, who had told her that after her stint in rehab, which had just finished, she had been collected by her husband and they had driven straight to an off-license to purchase alcohol. Mora was in tears. The news clearly deflated and devastated Mora. Her supervisor would describe Mora as being almost catatonic. And when she would ask Mora, you know, what's wrong? Mora just said, my sister. The supervisor decided that in the interests of, you know, looking after Mora, that perhaps it was best at this stage that sort of Mora finish up and that she escort Mora to her dorm room let her get some rest etc so when they reached the room the supervisor asked more would she be okay and more said she was fine that she shared the room with someone but this was actually a lie um and i think that it is indicative that at this juncture even at this juncture more was really craving some time on her own just to make sense uh you know of the news that she had just received on the 7th of February, Fred would visit his daughter, Maura, at UMass Amorous. He planned to buy her a car. Um, her car was literally on its last legs. There was smoke coming out of the tailpipe. He advised her to put a rag in the tailpipe. So he withdrew $400 from lots of different ATMs, which people found really strange, but he wanted to get 4,000 out in cash. And in those days, you could only take out so much from an ATM at one point. You know, in, uh, you know, at one time, should I say, and he wanted to deal in cash. And I totally understand that he was a man of a certain generation. It was easier to haggle with cash. And he and Moore did go around to various car dealerships, but they didn't see the car that they wanted uh, at that price. There was one that was slightly more expensive and Fred was going to return uh, probably the following weekend and they were going to get this slightly more expensive vehicle. 
Fred then took Maura and her friend out for a meal. They had a really nice time. Maura and her friend then went to an off license to buy alcohol for a party that they were attending and Fred paid for the alcohol. Now, a lot of people found this really weird. Would you pay for alcohol for your daughter if she was going to a party? Now, I don't think that Fred was a person who habitually went around buying alcohol for his daughter. I would say it was a reflex gesture. They were having a nice day out and he said, here, let me cover this, you know, uh, bill for you. I'll pay for the alcohol. You guys have a nice night. I think he was just coming from a good place. He then loaned more his new Toyota Corolla. And again, some people found this unusual for her to drive to the party. But don't forget that her car wasn't working. And of course, you know, he was expecting more not to drive the vehicle back. He wasn't going to be checking out of the hotel till the following day. So he wasn't expecting more to return until the following day. So, you know, he wasn't worried about her driving back, you know, with alcohol consumed, etc. So more went to the party. And afterwards, she decided to drive back to Fred's motel at about 2, 2.30 a.m. in the morning. Now, Fred wasn't expecting more until the following day. This wasn't a wise decision because she had alcohol taken and en route to the motel, she crashed her father's new car, causing $10,000 worth of damage. She was inconsolable. The police officer arrived and she was completely overwhelmed. Now, strangely, the police officer didn't um, breathalyze her. And uh, this is very unusual. And a lot of people have said, well, maybe she hadn't that much alcohol taken. I think that's unlikely. Uh, you know, even a little alcohol, uh, you know, and, and driving is quite dangerous. I think he chose to look the other way. I think that Maura appealed to this police officer. She probably said, look, I'm a nursing student. I've got to do clinical shortly. I need a car. You know, I think that she appealed to his better nature. We've got to remember that nurses and policemen are very alike in terms of their mission in life and what they do for society. They are out there on, you know, not a huge amount of pay, you know, looking after society, caring for people. And, you know, people have a lot of respect for nurses, you know, the work that they do, including trainee nurses. And I think he chose to look the other way. Now, I think that this has significance in the possibility of more possibly being still alive and out there somewhere. It shows that she could get people on site, even people in authority. Uh, so, you know, who knows after she disappeared, who she could have appealed to to help her. Uh, you know, maybe she was too embarrassed to return and maybe she has reinvented herself somewhere else. But I, I will discuss that in more detail later. So uh, Maura travels back to her father's motel on the tow truck. And uh, when she gets there, she can't get into his room because there's this sort of inner door that you've also got to get through. And she's sort of in the lobby area for a few hours. She eventually gets into his room and at around quarter to five in the morning, 10 to five, she rings Bill. Now, I think that this is also very significant. She rings him for comfort and reassurance. She's really upset. He says to her at one point, you know, is everything OK? Almost implying that maybe something else is wrong here. You know, all this bad stuff is happening to her. He didn't mean it in a nasty way. Um, but, you know, he knew her very well. And, you know, she was going through some stuff. Um, <clears throat> I also think that this call is very significant in terms of whether more could potentially still be out there. Uh, Bill was in the military. He obviously, you know, would get up early. He probably maybe even did that habitually over the weekends. You know, they were used to getting up early. The fact that she rang him at 10 to 5 in the morning uh, and, you know, when she disappeared, Bill would receive a call the following morning at 20 past 5 in the morning, which he missed. I think that most likely that was Maura. And I know that Bill and his mother also felt that this was the case. Um, so again, that is significant. It suggests that most likely she made it through the night. That much we can probably be sure of. Um, 
there's something else that I would like to say about this crash incident. And that is that I think some really awful things have been said about Fred. There's almost been an insinuation because Maura went back to the hotel or the motel, should I say, in the middle of the night, that somehow there was kind of some kind of sexual abuse situation going on or incestuous situation. It's really ugly. I mean, Maura hadn't intended to go back in the middle of the night. She had her own room in the dorm. Uh, Fred obviously respected her privacy, had booked a motel room. Um, there were twin beds in the room. She hadn't got into his room in any event immediately. So it's a really kind of horrible thing for somebody to to insinuate. And, and several people have insinuated, you know, that, that this was a little bit off. Um, I was talking to some of my friends, some of my female friends, and I was like, if you were traveling with your father and you're in a kind of remote place a town somewhere and you've booked a twin room and you get there and it's a double bed you know what would you do and they all said I'd, I'd bunk in with my dad you know this is fully grown adults you know uh, it's horrible to imply that if a, a father and a, an adult daughter are in close proximity something incestuous is going on it's it's just really really you know a kind of very dark insinuation and very unfair to all the great fathers that are out there um, you know, they would just bunk in. They wouldn't be doing it all the time, but just in the case of an emergency. But in any event, there were twin beds in Fred's room. In lots of ways, I feel that in many of the analysis of the Moore Murray case, Fred hasn't really received, you know, the recognition he deserves for the work that he's done since Moore disappeared. He was also a fantastic father and is a fantastic father. He used to visit her once a month at university. He was there to buy her a car. I mean, $4,000 in 2004 was a lot of money. I mean, he was always there for Moore. So why did Moore want to go back to her father's motel at that time of the morning? Well, James Renner in True Crime Addict suggests that maybe something happened at the party. And he bases this premise on the fact that two of her friends who were at the party refused to speak to him about the party. So he thinks something awful went down. Now, I think that James is maybe slightly over egging this theory that something went down at the party as if it was something enormous, you know, from which Moore had to flee. Um, maybe her two friends are just shy. They didn't want to speak to an investigative journalist. They're private. They don't want to, you know, hurt Fred. Um, I, I think that James is onto something, but I'm not sure that the incident is perhaps of such a huge magnitude. We have to remember that Maura was very raw after finding out that her sister was drinking again. Um, so it may have just been a small incident at the party. I think he is onto something, but I just don't think that it's that huge. Maybe she kissed a guy she shouldn't have kissed and Bill would have been mad as hell. And Or maybe there was a row of some sort and she just wanted to get away and get back to her father, who we know was a very comforting presence in her life. Um, and then, of course, the accident happened and just, you know, things got a whole lot worse for Maura. We do know that when Fred dropped Maura back the next day to her dorm, that was going to be the last time that Fred would lay eyes on his daughter, which is really poignant. And, uh, you know, after this period, he would not never see her again, you know, until this day. Literally, she has literally disappeared off the face of the earth and he has, you know, continued to search for his daughter. Now, Maura on the Sunday evening would pack up the boxes in her dorm, all her possessions in her dorm room. She would put them into boxes. She would take the posters down from the walls. Some people wondered had maybe Fred said a few harsh things to her about the uh, car accident. It's possible. Um, I don't think that was the catalyst for her leaving. I mean, you know, all parents are going to say something like that. You know, they, they'll be annoyed, maybe as much for the reason that she could have harmed herself, you know, in the car crash. I don't think that was the motivation for her leaving. I think the motivation for her leaving was a culmination of Vance going as far back as the credit card fraud, the crash, you know, her sister resuming drinking. I think it was just a build up. Um, so I'm sure Fred probably goes over it a lot in his head and it must be a torturous space. But, you know, he did reassure her subsequently that the insurance company were going to, you know, cover the cost of the damages, I think, bar a couple of hundred dollars. Um, he asked her to complete some accident forms, which we know she took with her 
when she did eventually you know take off in her car on monday the 9th of february and Maury would also email her work supervisor to say that she was going to be away for a week and that there had been a death of the family, which we know there hadn't been a death. So very mixed messages from Maury here. On the one hand, she's packing up as if she's leaving the university. And on the other hand, she's letting her professor know that she'll be or her work supervisor in the School of Nursing that, you know, she'll be back in a week. There was an email and I'm not quite sure when it was sent that she had sent to friends saying that, you know, they might go to a concert. This concert was going to be coming up in a few days time. This is what I call the spinning plate theory, where I think Maura was in a lot of turmoil, a lot of emotional turmoil. Uh, she needed to get away. Maybe she wasn't 100 percent sure that she wanted to come back. Maybe she did want to come back. So she left all the plates spinning. And a lot of time has been spent looking for a neat linear story here at this part uh, of the disappearance, you know, trying to make sense of this part, this lead up to her disappearance. And it isn't a neat linear story for reasons which I will explain. It's very ambiguous. It, there are a lot of mixed messages. On the one hand, it looked like she could be leaving. And on the other hand, like she could be returning. So it is incredibly confusing. Uh, Maura would then, on Monday the 9th, uh, go to an ATM, uh, draw out everything that was in her bank account, which was $280. She was due to get some money from other jobs that, you know, she did. And she would then go to an off-license and buy $40 worth of alcohol. She bought wine, she bought vodka. She would then get into her car and she would head towards New Hampshire. Now, Fred felt that she most likely was heading towards Bartlett in the White Mountains. In relation to James Renner's book, True Crime Addict, um, I think that we have to acknowledge that James has done some really good investigative work in this case. Um, you know, it has formed the bedrock uh, from which subsequent investigative analysis has, you know, have drawn, uh, you know, facts and, and details. Uh, you know, James got a lot of facts and a lot of details together, you know, very rapidly in relation to this case. I think the one area where he fell down is that perhaps he was a little harsh on the family, Fred in particular. I did see in a recent interview, James saying that he has a line of communication open now with Maura's sister, Julie, and that this means a lot to him. So perhaps both sides are moving on. I know that Julie uh, always appreciates, you know, any kind of coverage that uh, Maura's case gets. And, you know, James has kept Maura's case in the public domain for many years, uh, you know, and continues to add new light to the case. So we know that Maura was really stressed. I, I think this stress extended as far back as the credit card situation. She was in the end stages of studies, clinicals were coming up. She had crashed her father's car. Uh, you know, so much had happened. Perhaps something happened at the party as well. And she needed to get away. And she didn't tell anybody that she was gonna get away. We know that she lied to her work supervisor in the School of Nursing that there had been a briefment to the family and she would be back in a week. Then on the other hand, she had packed up her dorm room, which would indicate that maybe she wasn't going to come back at all. Again, this ambiguity and there is a reason for this confusion and, uh, and, and for the fact that we can't produce this neat linear lead up or explanation. Uh, very mixed messages from Maura and there is a reason for this. Now she did pack her nursing books in her car, her contraceptive pills, her hiking boots, accident forms that her father wanted her to uh, fill out etc. Now on the 9th of February she had rang um, about a condo in Vermont to rent, it wasn't available. Uh, Bill was also trying to ring her but she left a message saying that she wasn't much in the mood for talking which I think is probably very reflective of the mood that she was in or we could possibly think that maybe she was avoiding Bill, maybe something bad did happen at the party. It could be a bit of both and she headed off in the direction of New Hampshire. Now Fred is almost certain that she was heading towards Bartlett. It's an area that she and the family vacationed in you know for many many years. Fred says that you know Maura knew it like the back of her hand and she heads off 
and uh, she starts drinking it would appear when she's close to her destination because a uh, spilt drink was found in Moore's car after she crashed it and around 7 p.m she would crash on this very bench here hit a snowbank a neighbor would ring the police at around 7 30 p.m we know that according to police records Cecil Smith the police officer arrived around 7 46 p.m but before the police officer got there, Butch Atwood, a school bus driver, he pulled up alongside Moore at around 7.30 and he said, you know, are you okay? Do you need any help? She said that she had rang uh, AAA already. He knew that this was a lie because there was no cell phone coverage there. Uh, and he went home and at 7.43, he rang the police as well. Um, now, there is a witness, a lady who was driving home from work. She's commonly known as Witness A, and she was driving, you know, in this direction at 7.37. And she said that she saw the police was already there. Now, by the way, there is a lot of um, speculation about, you know, maybe a police cover up or maybe the police, you know, was involved in some way. I really, really don't believe this at all. By the time the police got there and Butch Atwood also came back out to the scene, Maura was gone. She completely vanished. Uh, the car was locked up. Um, she had taken some alcohol. Her phone was gone. Her credit card was gone. Uh, she just fled the scene. This is not uncommon in a, DUI, in a DUI. Now, Julie has indicated that there was a problem with Maura's license in New Hampshire, her driving license, and I will discuss this shortly. Morris scent was picked up 500 yards from where her vehicle crashed. Um, just outside Butch Atwood's house, it disappeared. Did she get in a car uh, at that point? Maybe take a lift just to escape the scene and not be under pressure. There were no footprints leading into the snow, so it wouldn't appear as if she went into the snow. So she literally just uh, vanished off the face of the earth and has never been seen again since. So now I'd like to talk about the motivation for Maura's disappearance. Why did she want to get away that week? And, you know, what was she thinking at that point? So the reason that I feel that we can't see a kind of linear, neat narrative that explains, you know, all the different actions Maura was taking prior to her disappearance. On the one hand, she's packing up her boxes in her dorm as if she's not coming back to university. On the other hand, she's telling her work supervisor that she'll be back in a week. There's been a bereavement in the family. So, you know, how do you make sense of this? And this is why, you know, so many investigators and web sleuths, they haven't been able to make sense of it. And I think one of the reasons is because I believe that Maura was suffering from bipolar disorder. Now, there's a really excellent interview. It's um, conducted by True Crime Garage. There's a part one and part two it's on YouTube with Julie Murray now Julie is so articulate intelligent incisive and the interviewer is just superb very intelligent very sensitive very wise questions uh, it's the best thing that I have seen on the Murray Murray case on YouTube it's just superb but in that you know the interviewer asks could Maura have had a mental health condition and Julie says, no, absolutely not, because, you know, she was holding down three jobs. She was on the dean's list. You know, she was so high achieving. But here is a resource it's called or a website, should I say, people you would be surprised to know had bipolar. And you can see there's Sting, there's Catherine Zeta-Jones, uh, there's Florence Nightingale, there's Virginia Woolf. At the extreme end, we see Van Gogh, because there is a variation in the severity. Now, Catherine Zeta-Jones, who's an incredibly successful woman who's accomplished so many things, and she's a wife and a mother, an incredible actress, she has bipolar too, which is less severe. So we can see that, you know, just because somebody is high functioning um, and very successful, it doesn't actually mean that they might not be struggling with a mental health condition, that even they are not aware of themselves and I think that some of this confusion that we see in Maura where she's indecisive it, it would appear she she didn't know what path she was going to take next she was leaving options open um you know she took her books with her maybe she was thinking she'd come back and do her exam she packed up her boxes maybe she was going to leave it open that she might not come back uh, I think part of this indecisiveness is because I think that Maura was battling with a mental health condition, probably more like bipolar 2, the less severe version of bipolar. 
Uh, and, you know, she was just experiencing really intense emotions and she couldn't make clear decisions. And that's why she needed to get away to try and get on top of her emotions and to see what her next step would be. This is an interesting piece in Psych Central and it's called What is High Functioning Bipolar Disorder? So some people are, are successful at managing the symptoms themselves and they can still achieve an awful lot. But I think that Moore probably was managing, uh, you know, symptoms of, you know, intense emotions, etc. very successfully for a number of years. And, and perhaps the condition just caught up with her. Again, here we see that if you put a search of bipolar and high achievement into Google, you get a whole pile of resources that show bipolar. Uh, you know, people affected with this disorder are often very high achieving. You can see the first result that's come up there is published in an academic journal on PubMed, which is a high quality academic database with health and medical articles. We can see, you know, here's another website, Meet the Dynamos, who are balancing bipolar symptoms. And you can see there's another one at the end here. Bipolar risk is greater for bright children. So I just think that, you know, Bipolar, it, it, it has, you know, variations in the intensity. There is a mild version, which is bipolar 2, which, you know, obviously that also has difficult symptoms, but not as severe as bipolar 1. And that it's a myth, you know, that someone who is holding things down might not be suffering from a mental health condition. So if we look here on www.psychiatry.org and it says, what are bipolar disorders? It says here that bipolar disorder is a brain disorder that causes change in a person's mood, energy and ability to function. Um, you know, and we could see in the run up to Maura's disappearance, that intensity when she got the bad news about her sister, you know, after the car crash. And of course, you're going to have intense emotions when you receive that kind of news. But I think that there is just something, you know, far more intense than the usual reactions, you know, to some of these bad incidences and that, you know, Moore's ability to function, you know, it just wasn't what it was. And and I think that, you know, she she probably was a high functioning bipolar, possibly two, bipolar two, which is not quite as intense as bipolar one. And I think that um, you know, this is maybe what precipitated or or prompted her need to run away because these are very difficult emotions and symptoms to manage without medication. This is a very interesting paper on PubMed, the database that I just mentioned, actually, which is full of academic articles in medicine and health, etc. And it looks at the risk of road injuries in patients with bipolar disorder. Um, and it discovers it looks at 3,953 people with bipolar disorder, which is incredible. You know, that is a large sample and it compares this sample with 39,530 controls, what they call controls from the general population. That just means they compare the people who have bipolar disorder with the people who don't have bipolar disorder, 39,000 of them. And they found that there was an elevated risk of road accidents in people with bipolar disorder if they weren't on any kind of medication. Now, if they were on antidepressants, this risk was lowered. I, I think this is a very interesting study because, you know, how many of us would crash a car twice in one weekend? Um, I, I think that, you know, Moore's, you know, behavior around driving around this time, I think is very indicative of having some kind of mental health issue. I, because it makes sense, you know, the emotional intensity that you have with bipolar, uh, you're not concentrating as much as you should be, your mind is racing, maybe you're engaging in risky behaviour, for example, like drink driving, which we know Maura did twice in that weekend, um, because we know that um, she had been at the party on the Saturday night before she drove the car back to her father's um, motel. And we do also know that she had been drinking, which I'll talk about shortly, uh, when she crashed the car in New Hampshire. Now, Julie, in this wonderful interview, she's superb in it, as is the interviewer in True Crime Garage. There's a part one and part two on YouTube. 
she says that she thinks part of the motivation for Maura going to New Hampshire was that Maura had a broken speed limit there. She'd been driving at 95 miles an hour and she got a ticket and she had to reinstate her license. And, and uh, Julie felt that perhaps that was a, a motivation. Now, for me, I feel maybe it was an added motivation. It was something she needed to sort out. But I think the main motivation was to get away and sort of figure out what her next move was. Um, so again, like, you know, OK, I know Julie has said in the interview, you know, we all do crazy things when we're students, but crash a car twice in one weekend and the speeding at 95 miles an hour. I don't know. There's an intensity and a frequency to this that I don't think is like regular student behavior. I think it's more indicative of a mental health issue like bipolar. And I found this paper um, extremely interesting. It's in a very high quality journal, their Journal of Effect Sword. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's certainly very compelling. This is an interesting piece in Medical News Today, and it talks about, is there a link between bipolar disorder and lying? Now, everybody lies. Sometimes people might say a little white lie, maybe, you know, not to hurt somebody's feelings, etc. Students lie. I mean, you know, their homework is late, their assignments are late, etc. You know, sometimes little white lies are said, you know, in those circumstances. But this actually talks about how, you know, doctors who are dealing with, you know, patients with bipolar or family members anecdotally have reported that they notice that, you know, these family members or patients might have a tendency to lie a little bit more than the average person. Now, there hasn't been a sort of clinical study done of this or anything like that. This is just anecdotal evidence. But it's interesting because we do know that Maura, for example, lied about, you know, that she shared her dorm room with somebody. She said this to her work supervisor um, the night that she was upset when she received the news about her older sister resuming, you know, drinking. We know that Maura lied that there'd been a bereavement in the family. This is not an uncommon lie at universities, sometimes when students are feeling stress, etc. We know that Maura lied when uh, Butch Atwood asked her, uh, did she need help? And she said she had rang triple eight. But what's very interesting about this piece in Medical News today is that it says that the reason that uh, you know, people who suffer from bipolar can lie, it, it's, it's to do with self-preservation in most cases. You know, they're not coping very well. They're trying to sort of, you know, keep things together. They have these intense emotions and, you know, so that things don't fall apart, they, they will tell a lie, you know, maybe to buy themselves time or, you know, to get an opportunity to fix things, etc. And, and we can see this with Maura. She, she told that lie when she crashed the car in New Hampshire because she knew that, you know, if the police came along, she'd already crashed a car on the Saturday night, that this could be quite serious. And she wasn't coming from a malicious place. This isn't attempting to be malicious. She was just trying to reduce the fallout for herself, for her career, for her family. And, you know, and, and this is the link between bipolar and lying. This is a, a very interesting piece in medical news today. So it's just something to consider in relation to the analysis of Moore's story. This is a very interesting piece from the Mayo Clinic, and I've put the link there, and it's about kleptomania. So kleptomania is, you know, obviously people just stealing things compulsively. They can't stop. Now, I don't think that Moore went around compulsively stealing things, but, you know, little things like the lip gloss, etc. And it's very interesting if you actually read the piece, and this is from the Mayo Clinic, it talks about kleptomania being a feature of bipolar disorder. Again, it's this sort of compulsive behavior, this intensity, this tendency towards impulsivity. Um, and I think that, again, some of the behaviors around, you know, the pizza incident and the credit card fraud and the lip gloss, I think that this is part of a, a larger picture, if you put it with the driving incidences and the, the little tendency to lie, etc. here and there. I, I think that we start to see that Maura may have actually been grappling with an issue perhaps, you know, pertaining to her health. And, you know, it's such a pity because with a little bit of counselling and the right treatment, 
she probably never would have ended up, you know, heading off as suddenly as she did. Uh, but, you know, as I said, these things are very hard to pick up in a person who is so high functioning. So I believe that Moira was suffering from what's known as bipolar burnout. And this is a really interesting blog that's kept by Breath Brownsberger Mader. And it's really interesting. And actually, she's also a runner. She loves running. Uh, but she says here, you know, um, I'm a go getter kind of person, not just in running, but in most things in life. You can see it here at the end of the extract, clearly almost to a fault. Having bipolar adds to my drive in that I feel the need to always be productive, to kind of prove to myself and to everybody else that I'm mentally strong. It is really difficult for me to understand or accept when it's time to just slow down. I tend to put on a hair shirt of guilt when I find that I am feeling overwhelmed or fatigued. The result is that I can end up a real wreck of a self beleaguered and just plain worn out person on the edge of a heck of a mood shift. I thought this was very interesting because I think that we can see here, you know, some of Maura's tendencies, you know, she was holding down three jobs. She was on the Dean's list, you know, you know, this doesn't imply you have bipolar, but I just think there's a kind of intensity to some aspects of Moore's life. Uh, you know, I think she had really pushed herself to the limit. If she didn't have bipolar burnout, I think it's possible she had burnout. You know, the pressure of transferring to another discipline, she really had to make a go of this second career choice, which was nursing, you know, nursing studies. And um, then she had all these accidents. I, I think she was burnt out. And I think it was bipolar burnout myself, but at the very least, it, it was burnout. So in this next extract from that blog, uh, Beth describes what she does to cope with bipolar burnout. She says, I put away the computer, the books, the art, the issues, everything but the daily necessities of life. I designated myself the boss and made a conscious choice to only do what keeps my head calm, resting, basic. Um, she says, I gave my brain time to get rid of the clutter, fatigue and overwhelming feelings that otherwise could lead to more severe bipolar symptoms. Conscious efforts at resting gave me a sense of control, choice, coping and recovery. And I think this is what we see with Moira. Moira, you know, packed up the books and, you know, belongings, obsessions in her dorm. Uh, she you know, told her supervisor she was going to be away for a week. Uh, she just takes the bare necessities with her, some textbooks, you know, her hiking boots, her contraceptive pills, etc. And she just heads off. And I think this was a conscious effort on Maura's part to gain some sense of control and coping and to, uh, you know, try to get on top of her life. Um, and, and I think that this, you know, description, you know, it almost mirrors what what Maura chose to do almost to a T. This is an interesting piece uh, from the Mayo Clinic, which explores the connection between bipolar disorder and alcoholism. And you can find substance abuse and addiction issues in bipolar. And sometimes, uh, you know, where there are intense uh, emotions that people can't manage or understand, alcohol is taken a, a, almost like a form of self-medication, you know, particularly if somebody is not in counselling or receiving any kind of, you know, uh, medical intervention, you know, such as antidepressants, etc. So um, I think that we can see in Moira that there may have been some issues around alcohol. We know that uh, probably as she was getting close to her destination in New Hampshire, she had started drinking. We know that she drove when she had drink taken at the party, etc. I think that there may be some issues there that perhaps people mightn't have realized that, you know, they may have thought, you know, that her drinking was fairly casual. My suspicion is that it was probably more habitual than people may have realized and, and maybe in larger quantities as well than uh, people may have supposed. This is a very interesting academic study that looks at the link between binge eating and binge drinking. It says that the two can be very intertwined. So, for example, if you've been binge eating all day, you may be likely to start binge drinking. The other way around also applies. If you've been binge drinking all day, you may end that day by binge eating. 
And we do know that Moore had uh, the issue with Domino's, the credit card fraud, buying food in bulk. Um, and we also know that she bought $40 worth of booze. Um, I think Moore had an issue around binging. And this, to me, actually you know, substantiates my argument that I think Moore may have been struggling with a mental health condition like bipolar, possibly bipolar 2, the milder version. Um, when I say milder, you know, it, it still has obviously severe symptoms, but not as severe as, you know, bipolar 1. But um, I think that she was using binging as a way of, you know, she's not getting counselling for this condition. It's undiagnosed. She's not receiving any medication. So binging is a comfort mechanism. It's almost like self-medicating. And I think that, you know, when she bought the $40 worth of booze, she bought that booze for herself. And that there were two motivations in getting away. One was to clear her head and the other one was to binge, which is a mechanism she used to help her calm down, to comfort herself. And you can't binge drink on your dorm. Now, I know that James Renner has a tandem driver theory. Some people think that she bought so much booze, somebody else must have maybe been driving behind her who was going to accompany her. I don't believe this. Uh, he also thinks, you know, there could be a tandem driver because you know, she disappeared so quickly. She just hopped in the vehicle. That was, you know, the person that possibly was coming with her to, to get away. I think that the alcohol was just for more. And it is indicative that she was... Um, binging um, and I think that when her older sister resumed drinking this gave more a little bit of a get out of jail card in terms of having a binge if you are trying to give up a habit if somebody else you know is also doing the same thing and then suddenly they stop and they resume the habit you kind of think okay well they're struggling too maybe I'll resume it just for a week etc so I think that this is what was happening in this uh, in this uh situation whereby Moore bought all of this alcohol and it had previously also been binge eating. And I think that bipolar could explain things like the binge drinking, the binge eating. Uh, this is a very interesting piece which talks about, you know, trying to self-medicate that people with bipolar, they use alcohol to calm their feelings of anxiety, etc. And I think that it's very possible that this is what Maura was attempting to do. And it's no coincidence that in her heightened state of anxiety, she purchased $40 worth of alcohol. She was going to self-medicate for the week while she was away, while she was trying to clear her head, make a decision about what she was going to do next. So I'd like to talk now about what I feel happened to Moira. And I'm going to talk first about the possibility of Moira, you know, not being alive. You know, something fatal happened to Moira. And then I'm going to talk after this about the possibilities that Moira could still be alive and, and what would indicate this. So these are some of the possible causes of death if Moira is no longer alive. Um, and it would be very sad to consider that, you know, perhaps, you know, something kind of fatal did happen to Moore, but I guess it has to be explored. The most obvious one has got to be exposure. Maybe Moore got a lift down the road from someone who could only take her so far. She was out in the snow and the cold, etc. That certainly has to be considered. Something in Moore's favour is that, you know, she was young, athletic. She had been in a military academy. It's likely she would have had survival skills. Um, so that is perhaps a mitigating factor that might suggest she could have survived this. But I think exposure has to be high up on the list. It's possible that Maury could have committed suicide. I think this is actually the least likely of the theories. Um, I think she may have contemplated it. it. It is something that may have crossed her mind. Um, but... From, to my mind, I think this is probably the least probable. Um, you know, her actions in the lead up to uh, her disappearance suggests that she was leaving the door open possibly to return and resume her study. So this might actually, you know, militate against suicide being a very strong, you know, uh, factor. The next uh, factor we have to consider is that perhaps she injured herself in the crash. Now, Butch Atwood, who did stop to ask Moira if she needed help, said that although the window, the car front window was smashed up, there was no signs of bleeding or, you know, that made any visible sign of injury at any rate 
that Butch could see. Maura said she felt fine, but she was a little shook up. So I think that, um, I think injury, we can probably fairly safely rule out as, you know, that she would have got so far and then maybe died from a head injury. Uh, murder is a possibility. Uh, you know, killers can be opportunistic. Um, maybe even someone who hasn't killed before. What are the chances that somebody malevolent was just driving by as Maura was, you know, wandering along the road? Um, you know, I don't know that they're that high. Uh, so if I was to put these maybe in order of what most likely happened if Maura is no longer with us, I would say maybe exposure. Um, I would say possibly foul play of some kind next, maybe an injury, and then I would put suicide last. Something we do have to consider is the Brianna Maitland case. She disappeared about 110 kilometers from where Maura disappeared, and that was March of 2004. So, you know, was there a serial killer in this region? Could it be somebody who was mobile and who moved around the region a lot? Maybe a truck driver or, you know, I mean, 99.99% .99 of truck drivers and all professionals are, you know, stand up people, but you can get a bad egg and across every profession and uh, they can offer lifts to people who are walking along the road. You know, they're known for being very generous to hitchhikers, etc. So that is something to consider. I guess if I was to, you know, pick the one that I think is most likely, as I said, I, I think possibly exposure, then foul play, um, maybe then injury and, and, and suicide. So it, it is something to consider. I do also think that there are many factors that could suggest that Maury is still alive. And I think actually the diagnosis of bipolar, that she may have had something like bipolar 2, may actually give some hope that she's alive for reasons that I'll explain shortly. This is a very interesting article, again, in another academic paper that looks at suicide risk in bipolar disorder. And it actually says, it's, it's a review paper actually, and it actually says that the likelihood of divorce in bipolar is 10 to 30 times higher than compared to people who don't have bipolar. So again, you know, suicide could be a risk. I personally feel that a lot of Moore's behavior suggests that this, this uh, desire maybe to commit suicide would not have been as high up on the list as one might have supposed given all that had, you know, happened to Moore in the days before her disappearance. I think lots of factors indicated that she was, you know, trying to figure things out. That's not to say that it might not have crossed her mind, but I personally believe that, you know, this is a least or a lesser likely uh, contributor to Moore's death if she's no longer with us. In relation to a foul play theory, even Bill has been looked at because later on in life, Bill would be indicted for sexual misconduct in the workplace and other women would come forward saying that Bill could be violent. Now, this was investigated, but Bill was, uh, you know, at a military base. It wasn't possible. Um, even when he arrived in New Hampshire to help with the search, he was always with people. Something that did cross my mind is that Bill is exhibiting a lot of anger towards women, uh, physically, etc. And it did make me think about the fallout from, you know, missing persons cases, the loved ones that are left behind. I think for the majority of people, you know, the family pulls together, you know, people's characteristics become better. You know, they they pull together, they're looking for their loved one. But you can imagine that there can also be corrosive effects of, a, you know, in relation to a missing person, negative effects that, you know, Bill to me is exhibiting a lot of anger towards women. And, you know, this could link back to his frustration over, you know, the person he loved disappearing. Now, having said all that, uh, you know, this may have been inside Bill anyway, if Maura had never disappeared, but it's just uh, food for thought. And it does show that, you know, a missing person's case, you know, the, the ripple effect that it can have it is, you know, really quite extensive. Now I'd like to look at the possibilities that Maura is still alive. And I believe that if Maura had bipolar disorder, and I have a strong suspicion that she did, this does give hope that Maura could still be alive. And I'm going to explain 
to you why I feel this could be the case. Now I'd like to explore some possibilities that Mora could still be alive. And actually, when you put them down, interestingly enough, they far outweigh the possibilities that Mora could be dead. Apologies, there's a helicopter noise in the background. I actually live near a military barracks and uh, you can hear all kinds of mu noises like marching bands, etc., which is interesting given Moore's uh, brief stint at West Point. Um, so I'd like to look at captivity first. Is it possible that Moore accepted a ride from somebody when she wanted to flee the scene? she is being held captive somewhere. Now, this isn't a, an impossibility. We do know this sort of thing happens and that women emerge two decades later, uh, you know, and they're eventually discovered, etc. My feeling is, though, that Moore isn't being held captive because I think she was so athletic, so resourceful, so persuasive. She was very intelligent. I think that she would somehow have maneuvered herself out of that kind of situation. The next thing that we need to look at, and this also is a very realistic possibility, is homelessness. You know, a sudden mental health crisis, a panic, you're trying to get away. Um, you know, these kind of scenarios can lead to homelessness. You know, people think that homeless people aren't educated and aren't. Homelessness affects, you know, everybody. It, 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 it can happen in any walk of life. And, you know, this is a possibility. Uh, you know, what better way to kind of avoid, uh, you know, the DUI, not having to explain yourself to anyone, uh, lay low for a while, you know, and then it just becomes a habitual habit and there's no way back. You're not sure how to reach out to your family again. Um, the other thing we've got to consider is that homelessness is often a gateway to a new life in some ways because there is the possibility of support, of sheltered accommodation, of social services. But in order to avail of maybe a new start, uh, Moore would need a fake ID of some sort. It's not impossible to get that. Um, and that could have been a route into a new life and a new identity for Moore. Um, so it's certainly something to consider. And I do think all of these are maybe with captivity to a lesser degree. I think some of these are real strong contenders. What I feel is a strong contender is that Mora was most likely, if she did get in a car, picked up by a good Samaritan. We know that when Mora crashed the car, you know, a neighbour rang the police. Uh, we do know that Butch Atwood came along and offered help. I think the chances of somebody trying to help her are far higher than somebody trying to hurt her. That's my feeling. And that could have been a gateway to a new life for Moore. We know that Moore was a very persuasive person. She may have, in a distressed state, uh, maybe even got into a car with a woman and, you know, a nice lady and maybe unburdened herself to this person and said, you know, I can't go back. I've ruined my life. I've crashed a car again. And this person could have helped Moore get established in a new life and kept all of this a secret since didn't want to betray her. Or Moore had convinced her that when she was feeling better, she would reach out to her family, etc. Who knows? You know, the Moore Murray case is very big on social media channels and it's occasionally covered, you know, on television channels, etc. But it might not be um, as in the public consciousness, you know, as you might think, uh, you know, obviously people who are on the internet a lot are aware of it, but that is also a factor to consider. Um, and that in turn, you know, the Good Samaritan theory could have helped Maura start a new life. Um, you know, that the mental health crisis that she suffered, she just felt, you know, so overwhelmed. She didn't want to go back. She just adopted a new life somehow in some way, a new identity and just didn't look back. She didn't have the emotional strength to go back, if you like. It wouldn't be that she didn't want to reach out to her dad or that she didn't love her dad. She just was so overwhelmed that the thought of even going back to her old life was just overwhelming. So that's something to consider. Something else that I'd like to say is that there has been a theory that Maura could have been pregnant. There were search terms found um, you know, in her internet searching on alcohol consumption and, and, and pregnancy, etc., and other uh, pregnancy terms. Now, Julie has said that, you know, at that time, Maura as a nursing student was doing midwifery, etc., and that 
that search was most likely you know due to this project and that's very likely but also we've got to remember that women can occasionally you know think that they're pregnant and look up certain terms and again I think the alcohol is interesting because it may indicate that Maura was drinking more heavily than she should have been um, but that doesn't mean that they're pregnant and I personally feel that Maura was not pregnant I don't think that Maura was the kind of person who would drink $40 worth of booze knowing that she was pregnant so I just think that that theory is a complete non-starter and finally James Renner in an interview recently said that he thought that Moore could possibly be in a cult there are a lot of cults in New Hampshire and you know this is a good place to hide out you're protected they can move you around if people are looking for you etc uh, I think that could also be a strong contender so again if I was to put these in order of possibilities I think the likelihood of somebody helping her and helping her to start a new life and maybe being in a cult are, are higher than than the other ones if I was to put them in order I would say the Good Samaritan and started a new life joint number one maybe a, a cult next homelessness and captivity at the bottom but we can see from this you know uh, analysis here that there is still a lot of hope that more could be out there so this is an academic study that looks at the prevalence of bipolar disorder in homeless people and it does say that it can be as high as 13.2 percent uh, of you know the homeless population and that makes sense you know with these intense emotions you could be living a perfectly normal life and then suddenly sort of run off and disappear and find yourself on the street so homelessness is certainly a consideration um, I don't know that I would put it you know super high up the list but it is certainly something that has to be looked at and uh, you know not to be dismissed in any way so this is Butch Atwood, the bus driver who stopped and asked Moore if she needed any help. Now, a lot of people felt that Butch uh, was declined by Moore. You know, she didn't want to avail of any help from him because maybe he was an intimidating looking guy. He was big. He was heavy with, you know, handlebar moustache, maybe a little intimidating looking. I don't buy that for a moment. I mean, Butch is a school bus driver. I think Moore would have known that it's very hard, even in 2004, to be a dodgy guy driving a school bus, particularly in a small area where everybody knows everybody. Um, I think it's far more likely that she thought maybe he would actually know the police, you know, that this is a kind of a stand up guy, actually. Is it possible that when Cecil Smith, the police officer, you know, was in the distance and his police car was approaching and the police lights were in the distance, she maybe had a change of heart and she ran up the road. We know that her scent was caught 500 yards up the road. Did she hide out on Cecil's bus? Did she say, look, I actually do want to get on? Did she maybe get him on side in the way that I do believe she got the police officer on side on the Saturday night, said to him, look, this is going to ruin me. I'm a nurse. You know, I've got to just get away from this and then figure my next move. Uh, I believe that he was a kind hearted, good Samaritan. I I, I really do. I, I don't know how he would have had the opportunity or, you know, the time to have harmed Maura. I, I think he was a genuine good guy and, uh, you know, I think there is a possibility that this happened and that she realized, you know, actually school bus, this is a pretty safe, you know, space. And maybe she ran after him and she hid out there. He was supposed to have done paperwork that evening. And then when the coast was clear, he dropped her somewhere. She had got him on side. She dropped him somewhere where she could get phone signal. And perhaps in a way, if she's still out there, Bill is the one who helped her. When he is giving interviews, I do feel like he's holding back and that he looks a little sheepish. And he did fail a lie detector test, though he passed a subsequent one. Barbara, his wife, in an interview on YouTube, said that he was really nervous. But I think there is a possibility that, you know, she could have got Bill on or Butch apologies on side, uh, you know, in the way that she did the police officer and that he was actually a good guy, a good Samaritan that helped her. I think at the very least, if it wasn't Butch, you know, who helped her, let's say he offered help, she declined it and that was the end of it. I think if she did get into another vehicle, the likelihood of a good Samaritan is still far higher than somebody harming her. Because we see that in the first half hour, in, you know, in which she crashed, you know, a neighbour rang the police, you know, Butch asked, was she OK? I think that, you know, 
the majority of people are good people in that area. So I think that's a far more likely scenario and it could suggest that more is still out there somewhere. Now, Bill has really been through the ringer because he was the last person to talk to Maura. A detective did follow him to Florida. He did subsequently retire to Florida. And Bill could be prone to telling, you know, some lies. He said, for example, that he'd been in the police force when he hadn't, you know, that he'd been in it at one time in his life. I think, you know, that Bill was probably that kind of guy who could be maybe a bit prone to exaggeration. I really think that's the height of it. I think if he is anything in this case, you know, he remains the Good Samaritan who stopped initially. He may have um, maybe continued being a Good Samaritan and maybe got more away from the scene. I think that's the height of it. I really don't think that he did anything bad to Maureen. He since has passed away, um, sadly. Now, some of you might be aware of the Missing podcast, and they've done lots of episodes on Maureen Murray. The two guys that do this podcast are, you know, really articulate, uh, sympathetic, kind-hearted guys. They're just really continually trying to add more detail to Maura's case. You know, they've never really uh, given up uh, at all, I mean, which is very laudable. And um, they often invite guest speakers onto the podcast. And here's one who is incredibly articulate. And it's uh, it's the Missing Podcast um, 128. Uh, I've actually got the links there to the podcast. And this guest speaker describes his theory of how he feels Butch may have, in fact, helped uh, more. And I think it's very compelling. But as I said, I think that if Butch didn't, I think that it's far more likely uh, more met a good Samaritan than somebody who was harmful on that evening. That's my opinion. Um, you know, the gentleman here who makes the argument that Butch could have maybe helped more escape the scene, he is incredibly articulate and insightful. I think he makes a really strong argument. But as I said, I, I do feel if Butch, you know, didn't help more on a way, it's far more likely that another good Samaritan did. So as I mentioned, James Renner in an interview, uh, in a recent interview, said that there was a possibility that Moore could have been, uh, you know, or become a member of a cult. Apparently, somebody took a photograph of a woman in a cult in New Hampshire. This photo was taken to one of those kind of super recognizers who match up photographs. And she found the um, the picture of this woman in a cult to be so like Maura Murray that it was, you know, just really quite incredible. Um, so, you know, it's possible. And this is a very interesting paper on um, ResearchGate, which is just a kind of an academic portal or database. And, and um, it talks about, you know, the kind of people who end up in cults. And it's usually vulnerable people and cults can prey on vulnerable people. And if you look at this extract at the end, it says, you know, that often people enter cults after, quote, key periods of vulnerability, following a stressful event, a relationship breakdown, death of close friends, failure in school or work. I mean, we know Maura had a number of stressful events in the lead up to a disappearance. So I, I think that this isn't unlikely at all, and, and it's certainly worth considering. I actually looked up the kind of cults that you might find, you know, in sort of Massachusetts or New Hampshire, etc. They all tend to look a little bit like Maura is my only, here's a photograph of some of them dancing. But, you know, Maura does have very distinct facial features with dimples, etc. So she does have distinguishing features. So if the super recognizer found the likeness to be strong, I would be inclined to, you know, pay heed to that person's uh, opinion. So something else I'd like to discuss is a tendency within some people who have bipolar disorder to engage in ghosting. And um, this is a very interesting blog post and it talks about somebody who has bipolar too and says, yes, I, I sometimes find it more comfortable to cut off all communication when I'm struggling with highs and lows. Um, it also discusses in the blog post that sometimes people can self stigmatize, you know, they are beating themselves up for having these ups and downs, these highs and lows. They feel the family is better off without them, etc. You know, and there's a lot of self stigmatization. And there's a very interesting quote here at the end by a lady called Katia. And she says, 
I, I do this a lot. She's referring to ghosting. I stop answering the phone calls. I stop answering phone calls and texts and avoiding any form of communication with friends and family. In my mind, I don't stop loving them or, you know, I don't cease to care for them. I just feel overwhelmed and I feel the need to create a distance between me and them so I can calm down. And I think that we see this in Moira. She had to pull back. She had to create a distance. Now, the factor that we have to consider is did she decide to create a permanent distance? Was she so overwhelmed by the second crash that she felt she could never come back? And the ghosting could have had an additional purpose as well in that Maury may have felt, you know, I've crashed a car twice in the space of, you know, just a couple of days. You know, there's a DUI. She might have felt, you know, she's going to lose her license. She's going to lose her career. Maybe she might even do some jail time, you know, that she might have felt the door was closed to coming back. So there's also, you know, that consideration as well. If you actually put bipolar and disappearing into Google, into a Google search engine, you will see so many things come up. Uh, you know, here's one asking, why do people with both bipolar disorder disappear or fall off the map? Um, here's another lady who's got a blog saying my bipolar fantasies of disappearance. Another one is asking, it's a mental health forum, is ghosting or disappearing common with bipolar disorder? Uh, you know, in untreated bipolar, the intensity of the emotions and the desire to, you know, escape those, you know, feelings of anxiousness, etc., feeling overwhelmed, you know, disappearing is very uh, um, appealing because you just get to start from scratch and you just leave all your troubles behind. And there's no cruelty uh, in intended in not keeping in touch. Uh, Maura would never want to be cruel to somebody like her father or her sister, but there is, you know, uh, as it said in the previous piece, uh, 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 self stigmatization, just feeling like you've let everybody down and that it would in fact be better for everyone if you never came back, uh, you know, and then more being such a private person, she knows that this case has been scrutinized very closely, etc. Uh, so it, it is for me, uh, you know, I, I think that the bipolar uh, and I do believe that Maura had uh, bipolar, uh, maybe the sort of milder version of bipolar. Uh, but it does have, you know, still severe symptoms in lots of ways, you know, not as severe as bipolar one, for example, but, you know, nonetheless, uh, you can see that this is something that can happen with people who have this condition, uh, you know, sadly. Nowadays, because of the blogging culture, there are people with bipolar who keep blogs and who share, you know, the ups and downs of having a condition like this. And here's one which actually d describes in detail, uh, Corrine Mayer, you know, this, this overwhelming urge to escape. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting. I've put the link in it there, but it does give us uh, an insight into this very real desire on, on the behalf of people who do suffer from this condition. After Maura disappeared, the following morning, Bill missed a call when he was traveling from a prepaid uh, card, phone card. And we know that Maura did have a tendency to use uh, these sort of prepaid calling cards. We've got to remember that when Maura had her first crash, she rang uh, Bill at 10 to 5 in the morning. Is it likely she's just had another crash? She's ringing Bill now at 25, uh, 20 past 5 in the morning. I think that this is probably almost 100% Maura. Um, it does augur well that maybe Maura did make it through the night. Maybe if she made it through the night to the morning, uh, even if she was out on the road, still walking along, it's cold. Maybe she made it on to establishing a new life. I think there is a possibility and I think the call does give some hope. Of course, even at that point, Maura could have, you know, died of exposure or she could have met a bad person. But there's a glimmer of hope, I think, uh, you know, more than a glimmer of hope in the fact that, you know, there was a call made at 20 past five in the morning you know getting through the night if you're out in the sort of wilderness the forest or just walking along the road is obviously the hardest part so i'd just like to mention something about moore's choice of career and just the significance that it may have had in terms of her mental health but first i'd just like to add one other point about the calling card the prepaid calling card um bill felt that he could hear a kind of whimpering or maybe a shivering in the call. Now, Fred listened to the same 
a voice message because the, the, the phone call from the prepaid card resulted in a phone, phone message being left on Bill's phone. And he said he could just hear it sort of static. He couldn't kind of decipher anything. My feeling is, though, because Moira rang Bill at 10 to 5 after the first crash, here's another phone call coming through at 20 past 5. There's a very strong possibility this is Moira. So um, there's a lot of hope, I think, around uh, that call at 20 past 5. But I'd just like to talk about Moore's career choice. Now, in the interview with True Crime Garage, Judy Murray says that, you know, that Moore made this huge switch from the military to nursing. This was a huge change. I don't see the huge change. I think actually they're very similar. Uh, both the military and nursing, they're very hierarchical. It's quite regimented. You wear a uniform, um, strong code of ethics, all of the above, um, pressurised very pressurized as well as a job and as a field of study and i do often wonder you know had more made the right choice the second time around uh judy does describe her as being a free spirit we know that she was mentoring athletes at umass uh at one athlete i think maybe there was more um to my mind i could kind of see her as being somebody who would have studied physical education in the end i think Moira was probably like her dad you know she liked the outdoors she liked sports I, I think that the professions she, you know, chose, uh, maybe, you know, they were very regimented and I don't know that they were actually suited to her free spirited nature and they may have added to her mental health issues. And I think it's something to consider. And maybe if more is out there now somewhere, maybe she might be doing something that that is more aligned to, you know, her personality. Sometimes it just takes, you know, some people to find uh, you know their path it takes a little longer for some people to find their you know their their true path in life and it, it's just something that I wanted to mention thanks to Julie and Fred and a sea of helpers there's been many new developments in the case a property recently the basement was dug up uh, there have been cadaver dogs there that had got a strong scent but nothing was there uh, digital billboards will be in Massachusetts, um, you know, in the run up now to the 19th anniversary of Moore's disappearance. Moore's details have now been entered on a national F uh, FBI uh, database and uh, the FBI has put out a national alert. Uh, and that's a really huge development. So I, I think, you know, there, there's just so many great things going on and uh, it's really positive. There have also been um, extensive land searches as well. So that's, uh, you know, another really promising development as well. In a recent interview, Julie Murray said, and again, it's the interview in True Crime Garage, it's superb, um, that, you know, Murray was listening to a song by the New Radicals as she drove up to New Hampshire. You'd know the song instantly if you pop it into YouTube, you get what you give, the New Radicals. And here are some of the lyrics. Don't let go. You've got the music in you. One dance left. The world is going to pull through. Don't give up. You've got a reason to live. And I think that this is an indicator of, of how overwhelmed Moore was. Perhaps suicide did cross her mind. Uh, but listening to this song, you can tell that she was trying to motivate herself to hang in there. I don't think she was just listening to this song casually. I think Julie probably thinks she was just listening to this casually. It, you know, it's a popular song. I think that this indicates that Moore was trying to get away to actually find a way back to her life and to get on top of everything. And I think that this song and the lyrics of this song are very indicative of that. So to conclude, I believe, uh, you know, and to summarize that in this video, I've put forward a, a, what I call the spinning plate theory. I think that Moira was having some mental health issues. At the very least, she was incredibly, uh, you know, emotionally stressed. And I think that she also had some addiction issues. She wanted to get away, to clear her head, to have a release. She left all the doors open, you know, the possibility of returning, the possibility of not returning to university, what I call the spinning plate, as I said, theory. And she just wanted to uh, get away and clear her head. She most likely would have got through this. Um, and it's just such a pity that a second crash would force her hand. I think that while there obviously is a possibility that something bad could have happened to Moore, I think there are just as many possibilities that Moore could potentially still be out there. If you know anything about the Moore Murray case, here are the contact details. Please don't hesitate to reach out. There's also the Moore Murray missing 
org blog, the incredible work of the family, as I've mentioned, and uh, please do reach out with any facts that you may have, however insignificant you might feel it is, uh, that piece of information could be very helpful. I'd just like to end with an image of more in happier times with her family. You know, they are absolute heroes. Uh, sadly, Moore's mum has passed on and Kathleen, her older sister, we just don't know the toll that her disappearance may have taken on their health. It's very sad, uh, you know, but one thing's for sure, this family, you know, they're absolute heroes. They continue to do everything. I mean, they're making strides all the time and we are approaching the 19th anniversary of Moore's disappearance. She's now on an FBI database. There are going to be digital uh, billboards in Massachusetts. They're doing land searches. There have been searches of, you know, a property. Uh, you know, uh, they just are trying every avenue. And I do believe that we will get the answers one day. And, you know, they are absolute heroes. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Every like, every new subscriber um, thrills me to bits. I'm not sure what I'm going to do in my next case. I've had quite a lot of suggestions from people in the comments. I'm going to check those out and maybe select one of those. Thank you so much for all the comments. Um, every like, every comment, every new subscriber means the absolute world to me. So do take care. And I'll see you in the next episode very shortly and all the very best. Thank you.